Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I welcome you to St. Andrew's United Methodist Church, Virginia Beach. I'm Pastor Witt. Hope you've had a great week. Hope you've cared for the people around you, that you've continued your ministry, that you've continued your spiritual disciplines, reading the Bible, talking with the Lord, listening to the Lord. It's been a beautiful week. Been a tough week on many of our folks. Uh, Al Lover and his family lost his daughter Kim. And um, want to keep her family in your prayers, if you would. Uh, several of our people have had some surgeries and been in and out of the hospital and such this week. Um, keep them in your prayers. Thank you for your financial support for the ministries that uh, are still going on because of your financial gifts and also your talents and such that you're placing into ministry areas uh the the finances uh we we've been able to to cut a check to the conference this uh week for uh i think three thousand dollars and um it's going half to missions inside of virginia and half to international missions and so um that's been wonderful thanks for your support of our food pantries uh in particular Ascension right up the street. Uh, you can carry food up there, provisions up there, or if you have to, you can put them over here and we'll carry them up for you. Uh, troopsters, we're still gathering things to send off to, to our troops. And so, um, you know, if you go to hotels and stuff this summer and get those little soaps and all those things, bring them and drop them in because they're incredible to be able to send to folks to help them along the way. Thank you for financial support. Three different ways you can get money to us uh, to be able to continue the ministries. You can mail it, you can drop it in the box, you can go online and do it. Well, I guess four, now you can come and drop it inside the plates here. We're in the process of gearing back up completely. We're trying to get ready to, to open Sunday schools. Um, of course, we have in-person worship at 10 o'clock. Uh, the AA, the, these different things are getting ready to come back online for us. The youth group are meeting at 3.30 each week. Each week of the month, there's a different thing that they're doing. Um, as I said, Sunday schools are getting ready to come back up, adult and children. A lot of things in the works and a lot of people working hard to, to get this stuff done. Are you ready to worship? Let's begin our worship by taking a couple moments to center ourselves on Christ. to worship. How very good and pleasant it is when sisters and brothers live together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, like the dew that falls on the mountains of Zion. Together, let us worship God. Yes, together, let us worship God. Centering prayer. Holy God, you created the world and all that is in it. 
the wind and the sea obey you. You are the source of our strength and our confidence is in you. All praise be to you, our stronghold and Savior. Amen. for illumination. Holy God, we walk by faith and not by sight. So guide our steps in your word today that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are kept from falling and find our way in your way. Through Christ we pray, amen. Scripture this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel, the 17th chapter, verses 1a through 11. 19 through 23, and 32 through 49. The Philistines drew up their troops for battle. They deployed them at Soko in Judah and set up camp between Soko and Azekah at Ephes Damien. Saul and the Israelites came together, camped at Oak Valley, and spread out their troops in battle readiness for the Philistines. The Philistines were on one hill, the Israelites on the opposing hill, with the valley between them. A giant nearly ten feet tall stepped out from the Philistine line into the open. Goliath from Gath. He had a bronze helmet on his head and was dressed in armor, 126 pounds of it. He wore bronze shin guards and carried a bronze sword. His spear was like a fence rail. The spear tip alone weighed over 15 pounds. His shield bearer walked ahead of him. Goliath stood there and called out to the Israelite troops, Why bother using your whole army? Am I not Philistine enough for you? And you're all committed to Saul, aren't you? So pick your best fighter and pit him against me. If he gets the upper hand and kills me, the Philistines will all become your slaves. But if I get the upper hand and kill him, you'll all become our slaves and serve us. I challenge the troops of Israel this day. 
Give me a man. Let us fight it out together. When Saul and his troops heard the Philistines' challenge, they were terrified and lost all hope. One day, Jesse told David, his son, Check in on your brothers to see whether they are getting along all right and let me know how they're doing. Saul and your brothers and all the Israelites in their war with the Philistines in the Oak Valley. David was up at the crack of dawn and having arranged for someone to tend his flock, took the food and was on his way just as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines moved into position, facing each other, battle ready. David left his bundles of food in the care of a sentry, ran to the troops who were deployed, and greeted his brothers. While they were talking together, the Philistine champion Goliath of Gath stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines and gave his usual challenge. David heard him. Master, said David, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight this Philistine. Saul answered, David, you can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young. David said, I've been a shepherd, tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it, knock it down, and rescue the lamb. If it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. Lion or bear, it made no difference. I killed it. And I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God, who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claws of the bear, will deliver me from this Philistine. Saul said, Go, and God help you. Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And he took it all off. Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook, and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack, and with his sling in his hand approached Goliath. As the Philistine paced back and forth, his shield bearer in front of him, he noticed David. He took one look down on him and sneered, a mere boy, apple-cheeked and peach-fuzzed. The Philistine ridiculed David. Am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? And he cursed him by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. I'll make roadkill of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a nasty morsel for the field mice. David answered, You come at me with speared sword and spear and battle axe. I come at you in the name of God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops whom you curse and mock. This very day, God is handing you over to me. I'm about to kill you, cut off your head, and serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and coyotes. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel, and everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear. The battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. That roused the Philistine, and he started toward David. David took off from the front line, running toward the Philistine. David reached into his pocket for a stone, slung it, and hit the Philistine hard in the forehead, embedding the stone deeply. The Philistine crashed, face down in the dirt. The written word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm not going to ask you if you have ever been frightened, because every Everybody I know 
at some time has been scared. Sometimes even things that are supposed to be fun are scary. A balloon that pops, a friend that jumps out at you, um, a scary slide or a ride in the park. Well, today's scriptures find the disciples in a boat in a terrible storm. And they were really, really afraid. They were terrified. The wind was howling and the waves were crashing over the sides of the boat. And they were scared that they would be washed into the sea. Can you show me how they felt? Yes, it's a very scary face you're wearing because they were truly frightened. And they looked over at Jesus and he is asleep. And they wake him and they say, don't you care that we may drown? Jesus got up and he ordered the wind to stop. And he told the waves to be quiet. And they did it. The wind and the waves calmed down and Jesus told the disciples they should have had more faith in him. The disciples discovered that Jesus was powerful enough that they could have faith in him. They could trust him if even the wind and the waves obeyed him. There will be times in our lives when we're scared when we're really frightened. And when things scare us and we become frightened, we need to remember that Jesus is there to help us. Let us pray. Loving and powerful Jesus, please comfort us when we are afraid when we become frightened, remind us that your love is stronger than the problems we have. Amen.
I say to you, use your own armor. Let us pray. Lord, help us to open ourselves to you, to open ourselves for you. That we may receive from you a message this morning, particular to each of our needs, that, that can help us become the people that you need us to be, the individuals that you need us to be, so that we may help bring your kingdom into this world, that we may enjoy life more. In your holy name we pray. Amen. What kind of battles have you been in during your life? What kind of battles have you been in? Uh, you know, as, as we look back across our lives, we, we can see that there have been many times when we have had storms, challenges, battles that we've moved through. I want you this week to, to really stop and sort of go back across your life and to, to take a look at those things that have been challenging for you, that have been storms for you. I want you to remember that, that your past victories, I want you to look at the victories that you've had in your life. I want you to, to comb through. You may even want to take a piece of paper and write them down. Um... There are so many different things that we go through in our lives that, that create times of victory for us that oftentimes we don't even remember them at all. You'll have to figure out what they were for you. They began when you were a child. They, they continued through your youth. They moved into your adolescence, your, your way of growing into an adult and being a young adult. I know you had a lot of them. Children. Parents. You know, as we move through life, the battle is constantly changing, morphing into something else. A different job, a different location to live. A, a spouse, children. Children. The children, they change from being real small up to being adults. And, and the, the battles, the, the, the worries, the conflicts, the storms that we pass through, they, they change. Our parents become people that are not parents anymore, but more like children. And even in our own lives, we go from being weak and needing other people to being strong and being able to stand, and then we begin to ourselves falter back into being less than we once were, and, and that's another battle. This past week, I, I talked with one person who said to me, you know, I'm getting older, and as I'm getting older, it's just really challenging for me. I talked with, uh, with Al Laver a little bit, um, Al's daughter Kim, passed away this week. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a couple moments, but that was a challenge. Challenge for him, his his wife, his children, their friends. I talked with somebody this week that said, you know, I've I've got a kid that's having some challenges and um talked with another who said I'm having rubs with my uh, with my child, who's a young adult, and having problems getting a chance to see my grandchildren, I talked with somebody this past week who who expressed the uh, the anxiety about going through another surgery. Another person, another couple that were talking about having to leave their home and move to a new location to to get care. We are constantly in these battles, as I call them, uh, metaphorically, these things that are challenging, are situations that, that are constantly creating for us challenges. So I'd like for you to take some time to go back through and to think about some of the past victories that you've had. Now, I'm well aware that some people seem to have more victories than others, but none of us go through life without having them. And I want you to remember them. I want you to then begin to take uh, uh, 
an accounting of the assets that it took to get through those things. See, oftentimes I hear people talk about how they did this, how I did this and I did that, but you ever watch any of the professional sports where the person, after they do something that you just go, how in the world did they do that? They turn and they point up or they go, Thank, you know. One of my buddies said, I find that offensive. And I said, well, I don't know why. I think that if we were to talk to that person, what we would find is that person is actually saying that, that they recognize the giftedness that God has given them and that through that giftedness, the things that they're able to bring to bear on the situation. I say to you that you are gifted in ways that you may not have even taken time to look at, to consider. I believe that every person in the world is gifted in some way. And you may look at me and say, that's stupid, because some people obviously have no gifts at all. I would disagree. I would say that every single person in the world comes with some gift from God. And that some people seem to be gifted more than others. Some of the giftedness that we have is valued more highly than other people's giftedness. I don't understand some of the people who, who seem to be folks that receive the accolades that they receive. I don't get how that happens. I don't understand it. I love football. I love baseball. I love some of the professional sports other than that, but uh, I have yet to understand how it is that these guys are raised to the place that they are. Movie stars, uh, celebrities, how they're raised to the, to the status that they are. The things in my life that I understand to be blessings seem to be vastly different from the things that are celebrated by other people. But I'm telling you, you are gifted in many, many ways. And I hope you know what they are. If, if you don't know how you have been gifted, then you really need to spend some time this week thinking that through. It's the time where folks are graduating from high school and from college. And each year when we get to this time, I think these guys, you know, occasionally you hear someone talk about how great a person was or is. And I've often wondered to myself, do they understand that that which they have accomplished may have been accomplished by them, but not without God's hand and other people's hand? If they hadn't been gifted by God to knit it together the way that they were, would they have been able to accomplish what they did? If they hadn't been gifted with the family that they had, with the situation that they're in, would they have been able to get to where they are. The world is filled with really wonderful people, many of whom will never be able to reach the heights of what we reach here in America on a regular basis. And I wonder if we understand that in my mind, it's a gifted thing from God, and it also places a responsibility on us to care for those who are less gifted than us. I think that's what God I think that's why God made people powerful so that they can care for those that are weak. The king's job is not to, remember the old movie it's good to be the king. The king's job is not to be the king. The king's job is to care for those who are subject to the king. And we learn this if we if we really study God, we learn that this is how God works too. God is able has all the power in the world, and yet came and gave us the greatest gift in the world, that of himself in Jesus Christ. So I want you to remember your victories. I want you to remember God's provision in your past for those victories. Now I say to you that, that you are probably either in a battle or about to enter into a battle. A fight. And I say to you that whatever that is, to fear not for the present foe that you're about to or that you are now dealing with, 
is just another lion, just another bear. This story of David is really wonderful because David is still a very young kid. And his bravado is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, he, he's off working, tending the sheep, and his father says, go and check on your brothers. And so he gets provisions and takes provisions to the brothers that are, that are there, lined up against the Philistines, Israelites on one side, Philistines on the other. And as he's talking with them, suddenly the giant comes out again, 10-foot guy, monster guy, carrying mail and helmet and spear, sword, these big giant shield. And he yells out again across the, the, the people, whoever will come and fight me, listen, if you win, then we'll be subjugated to you. And if I win, then you'll be subjugated to us. And no one needs to die except one of us. Now the story tells us that the king and all the people of Israel were scared to death. But David, having heard this challenge, stops talking to his brothers and turns to the king and says, I'll fight him. And the king, you know, the king is sort of like, oh yeah, 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 I, I can see that you're ready for this one. You're just, you're a child. And this monster of a guy has been fighting since he was a youth. Since he was older than you all the way into adulthood, this man has been prepping for this battle. Now, you would think that David, having any kind of sense at all, would say to himself, okay, and then back away. But he doesn't. He says, listen, king, I have been tending my father's sheep. And I can see the king going, yeah, okay. And in tending my father's sheep, I have met lions and bears. Or what I say, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. And... And the king says, all right. And he says, listen, if one of the, the bears or one of the lions comes and steals one of the, the sheep and takes it off, I, I track him down, I chase him down, and, and I take the sheep out of his jaws. And if he turns to attack me, I grab him by the mouth and deal with him. Well, <laughs> seems to me to be a little bravado, a little hyperbole in his statements. But the king, for whatever reason, says to himself, why not let the kid give it a go? None of the rest of these guys want to get into this battle. We certainly don't want to, to battle as a people, this, this people with this big giant guy. Let him, let him take a swing. He thinks he can do it. He seems to think that God's on his side. I also think that there was an anointing that we talked about last week on David, and that anointing gave him an aura, gave him a presence that somehow the king read. And so the king says, okay, fine. Now, here comes the problem, though. When we go into battle, we need to take our own normal provisions with us and not someone else's. David is, uh, by the king... He's placed the king's helmet upon David's head. He's placed the chain mayo on him. He strapped his sword around his waist. And now David is so heavy from all of this, he can barely walk. And he has the sense to say to the king, I didn't say I was going to fight him your way. I said that I would fight him and that I would destroy him my way. And so the king says, fine, he takes his stuff off. I want to say to you that you and I, when we get into trouble, need not to rely on other people's ways. We need to rely on our own. Also, I want you to understand that David is going into battle with this Philistine, having already used the provisions that God has given him, having already, you know, he had tuned all that stuff up. How many times had he swung his sling and shot a rock at a stick, at a piece of grass, at another rock? You know, my favorite fighter of all time was Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. 
and uh, probably because I was a little kid when he was in his prime and just kind of remember Howard and, and him back and forth, Howard Cosell. I like the bravado. I like the speed of his feet, his hands. Um, I just enjoyed him, you know. I always thought he fought one too many fights. But I want to say to you that there would be no way in the world that uh, Muhammad Ali would have been able to fight George Foreman and be able to do any good at all when he was first starting. Muhammad fought other people. Cassius fought other people when he was younger. And he learned his style. He learned his way. He learned his talents. He learned his weaknesses. And he learned how to be able to get around them and to be able to do what he needed to do. David was the same way. David was not going to step on this field having never fought anything. He's already explained to the king, I've already taken these things out and this is just another one. He's just simply bigger than the others that I've had so far. The progression of the battles in our lives seem to get larger and larger. And if we rely upon the battles that we've had in the past and the things that we've been victorious, the ways that have worked, our relationship with God, if we've developed that. I said I'd talk about Al a little bit later. Here's my Al thing. Al lost his daughter, Kim. And I was talking with Al, and I said, how are you doing? And I got exactly what I thought what I would get from him. Why? Because I know Al. Al spends an inordinate amount of time searching the scriptures to get to know God. He spends time praying. He spends time consulting God. He, his father taught him how to do that. Al has a long life, a long history of battles along the way. And running into this battle, this challenge, this storm of losing his daughter was a huge one. But it wasn't the first one that he's had. And he had tooled up getting ready for it. You and I need to tool up. We need to get ready. We need to be like David. We need to be ready to use whatever sling it is that we have inside of our spiritual bag to reach in and pick out and take it. But if we reach into somebody else's spiritual bag in the time of need, because we haven't spent time with God, we haven't spent time reading the Scriptures, we haven't spent time just listening to the Lord. I tell you, one of the things that will bless you in ways that you may not have ever even thought of being really important, but I would say to you, spend time in God's creation. We live in an amazing place. We have an ocean near us. We have dismal swamp near us. We have eddies. We have trees. We have birds. We have... Go and sit on your patio, if at all possible. And just enjoy the sounds, the smell of cut grass, the, the sounds of leaves rustling as the wind blows through them, the birds as they sing. Listen to creation, the waves, and be renewed. And understand that those things are not yours. They are not yours. They are somebody else's given to you. And that somebody else is God. And I say to you that it is in those moments that we are able to add new provisions, new stones to our bags so that we are more ready for what comes at us. Remember your past victories. Remember God's provisions in the past. Remember that this may be a new foe, but you have fought others before. Go into the battle with your normal provisions, with the way that you have prepared in the past. And when the battle is over and you have won, the last thing that I say to you that we need to do is that we need to praise God. We need to praise God for those things. We need to lift up the victory. Even if... Even if we think that it was our own ability, we need to understand that God knitted us together. God placed us where God placed us. Even if it was a difficult situation, it was through that difficult situation that we learned things to be able to be the person that we are.
If it was wonderful situations, it was through those wonderful situations that we became the person that we are. Our smarts, our looks, our family, our culture, our people, even our God. And our relationship with church and God. These things are gifts. Gifts to us. So that we may live in a world which is constantly, constantly accosting us with a new kind of a thing. When we're young, certain things. When we're older, very different things. Go into the world and enjoy. And be ready. Spend time with God. And prepare. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord, be with us as we uh, go through this week. We lift to you, Al, and some other folks that have had surgery this week and, and other trials and tribulations that, that are coming into their lives and ask that you would help them to remember their victories, help them to remember the provisions that have been supplied by you, help them to remember the way that they have fought in the past with you and won and help them as they pass through this thing, these things to, to be able to turn to you and thank you for your love and grace. Help us, Jesus, to love each other, to live the agape, to underpin other folks. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, all who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We've not loved our neighbors. And we've not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray silently for our sins. Hear the good news, the gospel. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray for the offerings, the tithes, the sacrifices that have come in this week through the mail, through the internet, through the box. Let us pray. Would you join me in the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Would you join me in praying the prayer of dedication? Generous God, we give thanks for all that you have given us. We return from it an offering for the sake of spreading agape, love, as the body of Christ. 
Open us, Lord, to even better ways to steward your creation under our care. Help us to aid you in bringing your kingdom to the world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we offer this prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on the earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join there in ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. The night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he raised it, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took a cup, he raised it, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of a new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, O Lord, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, by your spirit. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Make this be a means of grace for us, Lord. May we find you present in this mystery. May this sign and symbol of your sacrifice be a calling for ours. Amen. You may receive communion at home. Amen.
go into the world empowered by the Spirit of God and be people of God who are thanking God for what they have, thanking God for the battles they've won, preparing for the battles that are coming, and understanding that life is really centered in God, in God's love. Go and do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hope you have a wonderful week. Be safe.